Hi, it's Todd of Todd's Workshop here, and today we're going to talk about bollock daggers a little bit, a mm, little bit about them, and a little bit of how long they lasted and the, the changes that um, that were made during the course of, of their lifetime. So we're going to start right back at the beginning. I've just done a little film actually about why our bollock daggers called bollock daggers. The simple answer is we don't really know. Um, they're hardly ever referred to as a bollock dagger in literature or, or writings, uh, and yet you see them everywhere. You would think that they our medieval counterparts would differentiate one type of dagger from another by giving it a name. It, it somehow doesn't seem to be that way. They tended to refer to it as a dagger. Whatever sort of dagger it was, it's just a dagger. There are, of course, you know, exceptions to that, but, but as a rule that happens a lot. One of the very few uh, references to a bollock dagger is actually in Chaucer where he, he refers to, to bollock daggers. But then you can always come back to the point of... <laughs> What is a bollock dagger? Why is it a bollock dagger? I think simplistically put, and this is, the other film deals with it, is that they start life as being a very cheap object. Single-edged blade, peasant's weapon. So you, you want it to be cheap. So you turn the handle up on a lathe, the, the bodger in the woods does it, dirt cheap, burn the blade onto the handle. It's all very cheap. Um, you need some thickness to it to allow you strength in a, as a guard, because if it's very thin, then it would just break. So you need some body to it. But then, because the whole thing's turned and round, you don't get any good edge alignment. You don't know where your cutting edge is in, in relationship to your fist. If you put a flat on it, it's more comfortable to wear against the body, allows you to get your hand onto it, and suddenly you've got a weapon where the edge is aligned. And I think some clever guy just comes along and he goes, you know what, it would be really, really funny if we just carved a groove down the middle there, and it looks like a cock and balls genius right i think that's probably what it was all about it's just a cheap sensible guard form if you're going to make a, a wooden handle and the addition of the of the sort of cut between the the two halves to, to create a pair of balls a pair of bollocks i think it's just a joke uh it's a joke that's lasted 700 years so if we start at the beginning the first bollock dagger that I really know of is dated around about 1300, and I, I think it was Norwegian, um, a castle excavation. And it looks pretty much like this. So all of the daggers I'm going to show you now are actually from the Todd Cutler range. Um, basically because I've tried to put a full range together from the dawn of them at uh, about 1300 through to the end at the Scottish Dirk. So this piece is, is relatively unique, that it's got this sort of funny little double arch cut out underneath the bollocks there. It's got a nice little brass end cap um, with a bit of decoration on it. I never actually saw what the decoration was, if there was anything on the original, but it had a, a cinched cap like that and a single edge blade. This one I've just put a slight sh um, bevel onto the false edge, just make it a bit more interesting. Uh, but again, very stocky handle, very workmanlike, uh, very unsophisticated. And that's really how they started. They were absolutely peasants' weapons. Um, and this is just a good example of that. So the next one up is a little less uh, dated in the sense of those two cutouts on the first one really do date it as an early piece. Um, this one is even lower status than the previous. No guard, absolutely no guard, no impact plate, no nothing. Okay. It's got, again, no pommel cap on the end here. Um, so again, it's a poor status thing. This is, it's got a little peen washer just to decorate it a bit. But again, if you think in medieval terms, that's a tiny bit of metal and a tiny bit of work to give, you know, a nice bit of bling when you're down the alehouse, but for very little money. Strong single edge blades. They, these are working knives. They're not about weakness. They're about, they're about toughness. They're about utility. Um, there is nothing fine about this. It is a, a brutal piece of work for brutal people live in a brutal life, to be honest. Um, this particular example, again, it'll, it'll be good for um, early 14th century, really all the way up, if you're poor, all the way up to sort of late 15th century, where for average people, uh, the bollock dagger starts to fall out of place. I've got a slightly fancier one here. Um, again, this comes now through to around about the year 1400, um, early 15th century. Some studs on the handle here. The, the French in particular used to go in for really fancy handles on bollock daggers. It's like different nations have different things that they go on about. 
Um, the English, I'm afraid to say, were largely dull in their daggers. And if you want interesting stuff, you tend to go to France, Holland and Germany uh, and Italy, of course. Um, but uh, England's daggers were not the loveliest at this time. But anyway, so the French did love... Um, they just, they just loved weird bullet dagger handles. And this would be at the very non-weird end of the weird ones. But it's just a series of studs. It allows you to get grip. It looks fancy. Um, yeah, it's just a nice thing. Again, it's still not a super fancy knife. So there's no guard here still. There's just a little bit of um, carving to create a sort of a lip at the bottom, a bit of interest. The blade now is, um, on this particular example, is becoming much more martial. So it's, it's single edge there, but of course you've now got a, a sharpened uh, false edge as well running up here. So it's much more of a stabbing weapon. It's now, uh, by this date, it's becoming, you know, it, it was the archetypal English archer's weapon as an example, or at least it's supposed to be, I'm not sure if it ever was. Um, but it's becoming more of a martial weapon. It's, it's becoming more accepted as a weapon and not a tool. So the back of the blade here um, is blunted. So the false edge stops here and this is now flat. Again, that is still respecting its origins. It's still respecting it as a working knife. So you can now work with it. You've got a flat edge there. You can put your thumb on it. So nothing has changed now. So even now in the early 15th century, it's still not a fancy knife, right? There's uh, a little bit of sort of floral decoration on here, fairly crudely done, like so many of the examples that you see. So the beautiful, beautiful leatherwork is not what you would find on, on a knife like this. It's they were never about that. This is not about having money. You've, you've got this because you specifically have not got money. Um, so a bit of cheap decoration. Maybe you knock that up in the alehouse yourself. Maybe it came with it. Who knows? Now you get to the mid-15th. And again, is another English cutler piece here. But things are changing now. And the bollock dagger is now becoming an item of status. So you've got, again, a, a nice crimped um, pommel cap here. Coming through to the end of the 15th, um, mid to end 15th, you start getting these very sort of flared, very trumpet-like grips, which absolutely come to their height with the Lanschnecks. If you think of a Lanschneck dagger around 1520, 1530, incredibly flared handles, and this is the beginnings of that fashion. Other than that, you've got a fairly ordinary grip on this one. This is not a very high status version of, of this kind of knife, but it's a nice middling merchant's type knife. You've now got a guard on here as well, just a little cast brass guard. Um, you know, doing exactly that. It just strengthens the area, stops the blade sliding down, also looks pretty. And that's important. Um, we now have also a double-edged blade. This is no longer a working knife. This is now a, a knife for show, a knife, a knife for dress, a knife for offence possibly, or defence, but it is no longer a working knife. That is, those days for this style of dagger have gone. You can still get them. People People are still using by 1450, 1480, 1490, still using simple bullet daggers for work. Um, it's the knife that you own. But this is not about that. This has now become a status piece. Now, it gets to its absolute height at this point, and this is not the absolute height, but I'll show you, this is a, a Todd's workshop piece. So this is another piece that I've made um, as part of my custom work. And again, this is now, uh, it's a copy of one or based on one in the Rothenberg collection in Germany. This is a much fancier dagger and very much now not about work. So you've got an ebony hilt. Well, that's big money. That's already come from Africa. You've got a nice bronze pommel cap here. A couple of rivets. Now those rivets, those help to locate the guard, to stop it moving around when you're carving it. Um, and indeed when the whole thing's put together, because of course we're used to knives and swords that just do not move and everything's solid. That wasn't the case in historical times. Things were wibbly wobbly. Um, so it helps to lock everything together. It also looks pretty. Very, very delicate bronze guard here. And then a really groovy blade, double-edged, fullered, ouch, and sharp. It's got this strange little step on it here in this sort of fracasso area. I've got no idea why, um, beyond the fact that it kind of looks cool. And I think that's what it's about, but I don't know if you can tell now, but the whole blade, you can see that? The whole blade is, is sort of six mil thick at the hilt, but that of course means that it comes down. So it, it's a delicate piece. Um, you know, it's a proper knife. Don't get on the wrong end of it, but it, it's not the big, stout, chunky weapon that a bollock dagger once was. It's about show, it's about dress, it's about being seen. So that brings us around to about 1500. Now, Bollock daggers are now evolving. 
and I don't know this for a fact, but this is a based, uh, say, let's say it's about 1435, 1430, but it's based on pieces off the Mary Rose. Now, things have changed significantly here. Some things have remained the same. It's a flat back. They were almost all single edge blades, as far as we can tell. Single edge blade, quite stout, long. So the Mary Rose daggers were back to being long again. So medieval ones, maybe eight inches, nine inches, 10 inches, maybe. Mary Rose daggers, they're now 12, 13. So they've, they've grown, don't know why. A brass impact plate here. So the sort of the guard proper has gone, but you now have actually a plate of brass uh, under the hilt here, which again helps to stop anything being cut in. You've got um, an octagonal or hexagonal hilt with a, oh, I don't even know what to call that bit, knob end, uh, there you go, uh, with a very pronounced knob end which stops your, your hand sliding off. The hexagonal or octagonal shape gives you good edge alignment. But what is also very interesting is when you look at these, well, interesting to me anyway, you're probably not, but it's pretty uniform in size. I don't think that these were turned. These earlier hilts were clearly turned hilts. I think that actually the Mary Rose hilts are cut from a plank. And so I think that their, their method of construction has now changed. Um, the, the knife is put together in the same way and that you've got a tang that goes through and it's peened over. A uh, nice little peen washer again. Um, I, I kind of like those details on Todd Cutler stuff. It just helps to make it. Um, but yeah, it, it, so this, the way that the dagger has been constructed, has been um, manufactured, has changed. It's gone from a turning to sort of carpentry work. I've really got no idea why that should be the case. I'm not even certain that that's a fact, but that's my gut feeling looking at them is that the, the way it's been done is different. So this will take us through really to let's say about 1550, 1560. Um, I can't think of any other examples after that particularly. But then around about, let's say 1580, something else pops up and that's called the dudgeon dagger. So this was popular in uh, Northern England, Scotland, uh, so the border areas. Now you can quite clearly and immediately see the connection to a bullet dagger. Uh, We've got two little brass pins here. They might be steel, but those connect through to the guard. You've got a guard here, small hilt, the two lobes, not as pronounced. So again, if we look at that, it's quite flat and quite delicate now, right? So I think you can still see the heritage from bullet dagger, but it is, it is no longer a bullet dagger. So anyway, I know them as dudgeon daggers. There aren't that many of them in the record, but actually if you go to the museums in Scotland, you'll find a few. Um, but they're not everywhere, like bollet daggers are everywhere. This one has got a flat black backed blade, which is a feature I've seen on some dudgeon daggers. Um, most, to be honest, are a double-sided blade, is exactly the way you'd imagine. But these carry through from around about, say, 1580 um, through to about 1630, 1640, something like that. Delicate. They're not, they're not small, well, they're not weak, but they are quite small, they're compact, they're, to be honest, good fighting knives. You know, they're not, they're not the crocodile dundee, this is a knife. You know, these are small, but a bit like a stiletto in Italy, they're, they're to do a job. And that brings us to the, the Scottish Dirk of fame. So this is one here, another Tog Cutler piece. Long blade. So we're back to long blades again. It's funny how through, through the timeline the blades get longer and shorter and longer and shorter. So this is, the dirk was a, a long blade fashion. 14 inch would be on the short end, 17 inch on the longer end. So they're big knives, big old knives. Often it's said they're made from cut down sword blades. I'm unconvinced of that, maybe they were, who knows, but uh, often they're, they're struck with a Solingham mark, but lots of blades were struck with, with that or, you know, running wolf or, or um, or the Passau or the Solingham Marks rather. So I don't know, um, it's hard to say. The, the grip, it's very short. This, you might think it looks like a small grip. This is long for a Dirk actually. I've done that for sort of saleability reasons because people, if you put down a 55 millimeter, a two and a quarter inch grip, which is normal for a Dirk, people would just look at that and go, well, it's not gonna fit me. It does fit you. It's just that you are not holding it right or you, or you have different expectations. The bottom line is that you, you grip it, your hand is clamped up tight under the pommel there and it's clamped onto the haunches. That allows you a very secure grip, a bit like a rondel in a way, very secure grip 
and it also gives you good edge alignment. You know exactly where everything is. And, and look, actually, that grip could be another centimetre shorter. So for my hands, I could easily get away with a 60 centimetre, 60 millimetre grip, so um, less than two and a half inches. And the rest of your hand is all over the rest of the grip. It's just the way it was. To think that your hand goes on that grip is just totally wrong. It's not. It covers the whole thing. So now we've got a brass impact plate here at the bottom, sort of locks everything in, makes it nice and secure. Having a guard is always useful on a delicate hilt. If, if the hilt is big and bulky like early bullet daggers, you don't need that, that guard. When it's small and tight like this, it does need a guard there to control everything. Little bit of detail up under, under the top of the pommel there and a nice brass pommel cap uh, with hearts cut out. There is nothing feminine about hearts, right? Um, today we've got that opinion, then they did not. Um, so hearts are just a nice, nice motif for a knife, which you're going to use to stab somebody to death with, presumably. And then a castellated pommel nut. Um, again, it's sort of a feature you see on Dirks a fair bit. So really that just shows the evolution all the way through from 1300, a knife like that, through to really about 1700 with a knife like that. And you can see absolutely the language that it's, it's gone through. And it's not so very different at the end of the day. So you've ended up with a dirk, which is single edged, a fairly small grip with some brass or bronze detailing on, early bullet dagger, uh, single edged, fairly smallish grip, brass or bronze detailing on it somewhere. Kind of a pair of balls, kind of a cock in the middle, basically the same sort of thing. So you can absolutely see the evolution from one through to the other. Thank you very much. Thank you.